Rock Monster Genocide presents Wings Over West Virginia. What if an incident The eyes only see what the mind is prepared to comprehend. One measures a circle beginning anywhere. Come in. Welcome to Wings Over West Virginia. On today's episode, we'll be talking about the different aspects of the Mothman legacy, such as Injured Cold, The Men in Black, and UFOs. Let's start first with Injured Cold. He speaks without talking, you listen without hearing. Woodrow Derenberger was a typical Appalachian man and salesman for a sewing company who lived in Mineral Wells, West Virginia. On November 2nd, 1966, at about 7.30 p.m., while returning from Moretto, Ohio to his home, he had a strange experience. He was driving in his red panel truck on Route 77 in Parkersburg, West Virginia. He claimed that he saw a cigar-shaped metallic colored craft. The ship traveled right by his truck and blocked the roadway ahead and gradually made him slow down to a stop on the side of the road. Woodrow described the vehicle as the strangest thing he'd seen and said it resembled a kerosene lamp chimney. The craft was hovering about 12 inches off the road. A door opened on the craft, a being exited the ship, and the door shut with a loud thunk behind him. Later, the vehicle climbed about 50 feet into the air above the highway. The being walked right up to Derenberger's truck window. Derenberger described the man as looking like any ordinary man off the street, six feet tall, about 35 years of age, olive complexion, dark brown hair, and wearing a long black trench coat. The man spoke to Woodrow telepathically. His mouth did not move. Instead, he had a fixed smile on his face. The man looked in through the truck's window and said without saying something along the lines of, Roll down your window, I want to talk to you. During their communication, the man called himself Indrid Cold. He told Woodrow that he meant no harm. In the famous Derenberger interview, he said, I was very frightened, but as far as I can understand, this was all mental. There were no spoken words from him. I knew what he was asking me, but yet he stood there and his mouth did not move. He had a smile on his face. He appeared very courteous and friendly. Indrid Cold, Mr. Derenberger's conversation lasted about 10 minutes. Cold told him, I sleep, breathe, and bleed even as you do. Before returning to the flying craft, he said, we will see you again. Derenberger later reported this event to the police. An older man claimed that he too saw a figure matching the description of Indrid Cold on Route 77 trying to flag him down, but he was too afraid to stop. Derenberger's conversation with Cold can be corroborated. Other people saw lights and flaring vehicles at the same instant on the road. There were several witnesses that reported seeing Woodrow Derenberger stop on the highway talking to this man, and some even saw the flying craft parked on the road. Reports poured in of strange lights in the sky and beings, all at the same time, at the same place, on Highway 177 on the night of November 2nd, 1966. Woodrow's story gained traction in the media, gaining news coverage and attention after the Parkerburg's police believed his story. A representative of the Air Force even contacted him soon after his accounts were documented. During this media storm, he went on live TV in Parkersburg, West Virginia, where he was interviewed by the state police and Wood County Airport, the city police, and representatives from the Dayton, Ohio Air Force Base. Over the course of the month that followed, Derenberger claimed he visited Andrew Cold many times, and that he even took him in a spaceship to his planet. Andrew Cold would also appear at Woodrow's front door. His wife and children even knew that this Andrew Cold was paying him visits, and they even eventually came forward saying they too saw Andrew Cold and other strange beings. Woodrow's wife was terrified and said that these beings were much like us, traveled in everyday cars, dressed in everyday clothes, but were not human in origin. There was even one time where Mr. Derenberger disappeared for six months and said he was with Andrew Cold. This is what members of his family actually believed. He would also receive mental messages from his long-distant friend. They would come suddenly and leave piercing migraine headaches. His residents would often receive strange unknown phone calls. Sometimes there were threats to stop speaking about his experience. Other times there were odd beeps and electronic hums. Sometimes it was just silence. The family changed their number to an unlisted one, but somehow the calls continued. His story gained such media attention that locals would flock to his house all hours of the day and night and wait in crowds in his driveway to catch a glimpse of his friend, Indrid Cold. Bogle Ridge is another location associated with the story. Derenberger claimed to go there to meet with Indrid Cold and go on rides into outer space. Some locals claimed to actually seen the spaceships land there. On one occasion, two men armed with loaded rifles were hiding in the woods by Derenberger's property. They observed a black Volkswagen enter the front yard. A peculiar man, dressed in an all-black suit with tan skin, exited and talked with Woodrow before leaving. The hunters were disappointed. They waited even longer, wanting to see something truly terrifying, but maybe they already had. 
Woodrow hadn't heard of the Men in Black, but after his visit he was extremely frightened by them. Derenberger eventually decided to seek medical attention and the opinion of a Parkersburg psychiatrist. He not only left with a clean bill of health and absolutely no evidence of chemical imbalance or disruption, but his very doctor endured a reaction soon after their meeting. He was contacted in December by a most peculiar man. His name, Indrid Cold. He doesn't reach out by phone, but telepathically. This experience didn't just negatively affect Woodrow Derenberger himself, but his family and his close friends. It came by the way of years of harassing phone calls, people trespassing on his property, ridicule, embarrassment, job loss, friend loss, headaches, and depression. He suffered a bitter divorce and had to move away from the area because of his notoriety. He would later tell how his writings would disappear from his locked house, and letters he sent would never reach their destination. He felt he was being watched. He moved away to escape his past, and lived elsewhere for a long time. Years later, he moved back to the area and passed away in 1990. And now, on to the terrifying men that visited him in the Volkswagen, the Men in Black, or MIBs as John Keel calls them. John Keel, the main investigator of the Mothman, would often say, watch your back for the Men in Black. The Men in Black, or MIB, were unknown persons that frequented the small town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, usually dressed from head to toe in black suits, white shirts, black ties, and black shoes, which all appeared to be in perfect appearance, but yet completely out of style for the time of 1966. They were known for attempting to threaten witnesses and reporters of strange occurrences such as the Mothman into silence. They were sometimes thought of as damage control, as if their job was to contain and stifle information from getting out to the public. Not only did they visit reporter Mary Heyer and question her about the creature, but one of them threatened Mothman witness Connie Carpenter, with a vague threatening note reading, Be careful girl, I can get you yet, and ripped her blouse while trying to pull her into his car. When Mothman witness Fade Whit Laporte and her brother tried to return to the TNT area a few days after their sighting, it was blocked off by two men in black who would not let them enter. Their hair is jet black and shiny, and their skin is said to be without blemish or even almost translucent. Strange eyes sometimes covered by dark sunglasses, and movement that appeared to be sometimes robotic in nature. Mary Heyer noted the olive skin tone and that they never blinked their eyes. The men in black also had strange eating behaviors. Witnesses say they didn't know how to use a knife and fork, and the waitress had to come over and show the man how to cut his steak. They didn't chew their food, they just kind of swallowed it. They usually traveled in groups of two or three, and had a knack for knowing things about the witnesses they taunted. Things that only the witness knew. There were even reports of them being masters of illusion by way of being able to make themselves appear and disappear without a trace. Some have reported them carrying sophisticated gadgets, and one woman claimed that the MIBs erased part of her memory. John Keel, the main investigator of the Mothman and author of the Mothman Prophecies, is credited for popularizing the term Men in Black as a generic way of describing these mysterious men. Keel would chase the Men in Black in attempts to confront them. He had local police in many towns looking for them. When he was in West Virginia and Ohio, people would call his hotel room and tell him that the MIB were there. He'd run over to the location, but they would be gone by the time he arrived. The MIB mainly drove in Cadillacs until John Keel started doing articles about the MIB driving these cars. Then they switched to Volkswagens. The strangest thing about the vehicles is that they were late models, usually from the 40s or 50s, but they would look entirely brand new. One night in January 1967, Mary Heyer was working late at her office in the county courthouse, and an unknown man walked in the door. He was described as very short and had strange eyes covered by thick glasses. He had long jet black hair, cut square like a bowl cut, and spoke in a peculiar low halted voice. The man asked for directions to Welsh, West Virginia, and kept getting closer and closer as he talked. His eyes stared almost hypnotically. He questioned her, asking what right she had to print these stories in the paper. Mary was alarmed and scared, so she summoned the newspaper circulation manager to her office. She said that at one point in the discussion, she answered the telephone and noticed the little man pick up a ballpoint pen from her desk. He looked at it in amazement, as though he'd never seen it before. Then he grabbed the pen, laughed loudly, and ran out the building. A couple of weeks later, Hire was crossing the street near her office and saw the same man. He appeared surprised when he realized she was watching, and so he turned away and ran towards a large black car that suddenly came around the corner. The little man climbed in the car and quickly drove away. During the Christmas week, after the bridge disaster, a short man entered Mary Hire's office. He was dressed in a black suit and tie. He was not interested in the bridge disaster, but wanted to know more about the local UFO sightings. Hire was too busy to talk with him, so she handed him a file of relevant press clippings instead. He was not interested in him, and insisted on speaking with her. She finally dismissed him from her office. That night, an identical described man visited the home of several witnesses in the area. He made all of them very uneasy and uncomfortable. While claiming to be a reporter from Cambridge, Ohio, 
he inadvertently admitted that he didn't know where Columbus, Ohio was, even though the two towns are just a few miles apart. Some MIBs even dress in Air Force or military uniform, but always with something just a bit wrong, such as the insignia being in the wrong place, wearing the wrong shoes, or driving a car that is not standard for a military officer. The cars they would drive had license plate that had never been issued to anyone. One woman in Wisconsin said she invited the officer in and offered him jello. He tried to drink the jello. These strange men impersonating officials are also referred to by the term men in black. Another strange occurrence that would be classified as MIB is the Phantom Meter Readers, which is a man dressed in coveralls who would knock on the door of a house in the suburbs and say he'd come to read the electronic or gas meter. He'd go down into the basement and not come out. Eventually, after hours had passed, the owner of the house would go to check on him. Sometimes the man would be gone altogether, never to be seen again, even when there was no way out of the basement. Other times the man would just be starting up the stairs as he opened the door. Then there were the phantom photographers, who would drive up to a house of a witness who just had a baby and say they were professional photographers who wanted to take pictures. The new parents were delighted and agreed to have it done. The men would set up their equipment and take pictures, give the people a business card with neighboring town listed, then drive away and never return to sell them the photographs. These photographers would also take pictures of houses after the owner had been witness to something strange. They'd pull up in black Cadillacs, take out a big tripod and a heavy camera, set it on the tripod, snap a picture of the house, then put it all back in the car and drive away without going up to the door or offering to sell the pictures. Some thought they were government agents, some thought they were aliens, some thought they were time travelers or from another dimension or spiritual realm. Whoever they are, they left a strong impression on those who witnessed these mysterious men when they roamed the streets of Point Pleasant. And now for what these men in black seem to really be interested in, UFOs. You might be thinking, what do UFOs have to do with the Mothman? Well, for starters, the main investigator of the Mothman, John Keel, was a UFOologist. And when he found out about the Mothman, it was because he was studying UFOs. There was a large UFO flap, wave, or flurry that was happening in West Virginia in 1966 at the time. It was going on around the Ohio River, which is where Point Pleasant is. And let's not forget that the Mothman could even be classified as a UFO himself, because it is an unidentified flying object. A UFO, in its most general definition, is any apparent anomaly in the sky that has not been identified as a known object or phenomenon. Culturally, UFOs are associated with claims of visitations of extraterrestrial life and have become popular subjects in fiction. While UFOs are often later identified as explainable objects, sometimes identification may not be possible, owing to the usually low quality of evidence related to UFO sightings, which is generally anecdotal evidence and eyewitness accounts. Stories of fantastical celestial apparitions have been told since antiquity, but the term UFO was originally created in 1953 by the United States Air Force to serve as a catch-all for such reports. In its initial definition, the U.S. Air Force stated that a UFO was any air-bound object which by performance, aerodynamic characteristic, or unknown feature does not conform to any presently known aircraft or missile type, or which cannot be positively identified as a familiar object. Accordingly, the term was initially restricted to fractions of cases which remained unidentified after investigation, as the Air Force was interested in potential national security reasons and or technical aspects. During the late 1940s and through the 1950s, UFOs were referred to popularly as flying saucers or flying disks. The term UFO became more widespread during the 1950s, at first in technical literature, but later in popular use. UFOs garnered considerable interest during the Cold War, an era associated with heightened concern for national security. Various studies have concluded that the phenomenon does not represent a threat to national security, nor does it contain anything worthy of scientific pursuit. Studies have established that the majority of UFO observations are misidentified conventional objects or natural phenomenon. Most commonly, aircraft, balloons, clouds, or astronomical objects, such as meteors or bright planets with small percentage even being hoaxes. Between 5% and 20% of reported sightings are not explained, and therefore can be classified as unidentified in the strictest sense. While proponents of the extraterrestrial hypothesis suggest that these unexplained reports are of alien spacecraft, the null hypothesis cannot be excluded that these reports are simply other phenomena that cannot be identified due to lack of complete information or due to necessary subjectivity of the reports. The term UFOlogy is used to describe the collected efforts of those who study reports and associated evidence of unidentified flying objects. UFOs have become a prevalent theme in modern culture, and the social phenomenon has been the subject of academic research in sociology and psychology. Unexplained aerial observations have been reported throughout history. Some were undoubtedly astronomical in nature, 
comets, bright meteors, one or more of the five planets that can be seen with the naked eye, planetary conjunctions, or astrospheric optical phenomenons. An example is Halley's Comet, which was recorded first by Chinese astronomers in 240 BC and possibly as early as 460 BC. Such sightings throughout history were often treated as supernatural, as being angels or other religious omens. Some current UFO researchers have noticed similarities between some religious symbols in medieval paintings and UFO reports, though the canonical and symbolic character of such images is documented by art historians placing more conventional religions' interpretations on such image. In March of 1966, a wave, flurry, or flap of UFO sightings across southeast Michigan arose media attention, bringing the issue of UFOs back to popular attention. Controversy arose when the UFO's scientific consultant concluded that at least some of the sightings were a result of swamp gas, an explanation similarly rejected by witnesses and other state citizens. The ensuing public outcry was instrumental in bringing about the scientific study of unidentified flying objects, the only academic assessment of the topic completed to date, and the last attempt on the part of the U.S. Air Force to settle the unrelenting mystery of the UFO. And then the Michigan flap seeped over into the state of Ohio. On April 16th, 1966, several police officers in Portridge County, Ohio, pursued an unidentified flying object for half an hour before watching it disappear into the night sky, and popular interest compelled the Air Force to conduct an investigation. The Air Force's conclusion that the officer had misidentified ordinary occurrences opened the witness up to a torrent of ridicule. Some of the witnesses, already emotionally disturbed what they saw, were so harshly scrutinized that they quit the force to escape the public eye. From Michigan to Ohio to West Virginia. Investigator John Keel was pushed into the flying saucer field in 1966 by an editor who wanted the definitive article on the subject. As he attempted to find UFO experts and get the Air Force side of the story, Michigan's 1966 UFO flurry seeped across Ohio into West Virginia, where began an 18-month series of reports of flying objects. When John Keel heard the reports of the Scarberry and Mallet Mothman sighting, he was interested and so he drove 80 miles that December to Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Aside from the Mothman investigation, there had also been countless UFO sightings up and down the Ohio River all that year. Eerie, diamond, brilliant lights passed over Point Pleasant every night at 8.30 on a regular schedule. Keel decided to investigate the situation. He inspected mutilated animals in the farm fields of West Virginia and spent many cold and scary nights on hilltops watching lights in the sky. When he signaled them with a flashlight in Morse code, they actually seemed to respond. If he flashed the word descend, they would drop downward in a falling leaf-like motion. John Keel thought that the possibility of them being spaceships from another world was not very likely. He said, quote, They seemed like mischievous masses of energy, playing simple-minded games with a simple-minded human. As a professional simpleton, I have seen so many of these strange lights that I have actually lost count. The sheer quantity of these objects and the frequency of their appearance negates the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And now for some sightings. In October 1974, near Elm, New York, Fordian investigator Virginia M. Miller reported that a witness saw an immense bird-like creature with a wingspan of about 9 or 10 feet, a human-like body, and a large grotesque head. In Portland, Oregon, three people saw an unknown winged creature Monday evening standing on the interstate bridge. Will Davis, Hank and Susan Miller claimed they were driving over the bridge in two different cars when they noticed the strange shape. Davis, age 45, is a janitor that was driving home at the time of the encounter. He says, the figure looked like an angel, and that it was sitting on top of the green structure. The interstate bridge, built in 1917, serves as a connection point for traffic between Portland and Vancouver over the Columbia River. Never said anything like that, says Davis. I was sitting right here. I saw it right before I drove into the bridge. Spooky stuff. It was big. I didn't know how big, but it wasn't a bird. I saw arms and legs. The Millers were driving ahead of Davis and about to come over the bridge when the creature took off. The couple claimed that the animal exhibited 20-foot wingspan. I was still looking back, trying to figure out what it was on top of the bridge or the midsection. It flew right in front of us into the right side of the bridge, says Susan, age 29. Hank was driving and I tell him, hey, look out. What the heck is that? He saw it too, but I was able to see it much better than him for sure since he was the one driving. Whatever it was, it was big. At first I thought it was a prank or a city worker fixing something over the bridge. I'm telling Hank, why would they have a worker this late in the evening? Isn't it kind of dangerous? Until it began flying. I reached for my phone inside my purse, but the thing wasn't there anymore. It looked like an angel. I didn't see its face, but I could make out a tail. Even from far away, the body was black. She said it was the Mothman, interrupts Hank Miller, mocking his wife. I laughed, but I saw it too. Not much to be seen, honestly, but I assure you there was something flying and it was huge. It looked like a man, a man with wings. Tons of artists in Portland, you never know. 
Until next time, West Virginia, watch the skies everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching the skies.